Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Lynn Ransom. I'm the curator of programs at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies. And I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of my colleagues at the Schoenberg uh, Institute to tonight's program that's dedicated to the aesthetics and culture of South Asian manuscript collections and archives. Penn Libraries, as many of you know, is home to one of the largest collections of South Asian manuscripts in North America. So we're especially delighted to have the opportunity this program brings to think more deeply about contemporary practices of manuscript care in India and how it might inform our understanding of our own collection. It is therefore my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Prof Professor Anthony Cerulli. Professor Cerulli is Associate Professor of South Asian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and his primary research interests lie at the intersections of pre-modern and modern literary cultures in India at sites of ritual healing among Hindu communities and in institutions of medical education. His publications, his many publications, include uh, the edited volume, The Gift in India, Theory and Practice, co-edited with Marian Bentler and that came out last year, and his 2012 monograph, Somatic Lessons, Narrating Patienthood and Illness in Indian Medical Literature. Professor Cerulli's work in this area has been recognized by numerous fellowships from the Library of Congress, Congress, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the European Institute for Advanced Studies, among several others. Tonight, though, Professor Cerulli will be stepping out of his scholar's robes to highlight his artistic work as a photographer who has turned his lens on the manuscript collections and archives of South Asia. These photographs, which are featured in the exhibition Downstairs Manuscript, Manuscriptistan, which is on view in the Cayman Gallery uh, on the first floor, are the result of a larger project of the same name, which has received support from the Guggenheim Foundation. This project, as will be explained, explores the aesthetics of these spaces through sensitive renderings of these paper and palm leaf books and the people who tend them. After the lecture, Penn Library South Asian Studies librarian Jeff Pierce will lead a panel discussion on the spaces, artifacts, and lives of South Asian archives after which we invite you to join us for a reception and a glass of wine in the Cayman Gallery. For now, please join me in welcoming uh, Anthony Cerulli for his talk entitled, Seeing, Framing, and Experiencing Manuscript Cultures in Contemporary India. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm happy to be here. I'm really happy to have my photographs hanging downstairs on the first floor. Um, this project began a while ago, as I'll explain, but actually the project to be hanging here began a while ago. So Lynn and I talked about this three and a half years ago, I think, is when it, we started talking about this. So thank you, thank Andrea, I'm not, I don't think she's in here, thank Will. Benji, uh, who was here at the time, also was integral in that, and Jeff, of course, thank you for pulling this together, and the panelists who will respond. So I'm not going to be pulling up pictures from downstairs and just talking about the ones that are hanging, but rather I'm going to give you some, some insights into what my thinking is for, for why I pulled this project together, or rather why I've been taking pictures of manuscript archives uh, as, as art objects and art spaces. The Manuscript Stand project began in 2003 when I was a graduate student, when I was in graduate school doing pre-dissertation research in South India. I was in Western Tamil Nadu studying one of the Sanskrit medical classics, the Charaka Sahita, with Dr. Mishra, an Ayurvedic doctor and former professor of Ayurveda. At the time, Dr. Mishra ran a research institute that was connected to an inpatient Ayurvedic health center. The place was a mixture of spa-like accommodations for patients and Spartan clinical uh, Spartan clinical rooms for doctor visits. It was my first experience with what is sometimes called Ayurvedic tourism, which is especially popular in Tamil Nadu's neighboring state to the west, Kerala. I spent about a week studying with Dr. Mishra. He was a mesmerizing teacher, and he set me down a path of discovery of the Charaka Sanhita and several other old and not so old Sanskrit medical texts that I still work on today. But it was Dr. Mishra's matchmaking that planted the seeds of the Manuscriptistan project. I had about 10 unplanned days in between my time with Dr. Mishra and my next obligation, which involved a long train ride north to Benares to do more research and run some archival errands for one of my professors. I didn't feel very well as my work with Dr. Mishra was ending, however, <clears throat> and I considered staying a few extra days at the health center to recuperate before going to Benares. 
When I mentioned this to Dr. Mishra, he sat me down, felt my forehead, and checked my pulse. You're not that sick, he said. You have a cold and maybe some lingering jet lag. He gave me an Ayurvedic decoction and some thick charcoal colored paste to smear on my forehead throughout the day. Drink the decoction, apply the paste, and see me in the morning, he coolly instructed. And then he added, you'll have a roommate this evening, a man from Japan. I followed my prescription, and around dinner time, as I sat in my room reading, medicinal paste flaking from my forehead, Dr. Matsuzaka arrived. Dr. Matsuzaka and I got to know each other that night over dinner on the veranda. I learned that he and Dr. Mishra were old friends and collaborators, and that Dr. Mishra had told him I would be a good assistant to him over the next three or four days on a documentary project he was doing in Kerala. In the morning, Dr. Matsuzaka and one of Dr. Mishra's students, Gopal, were going to drive to Kerala to film a number of private manuscript collections and interview some of the people associated with them. I was intrigued, and the next morning I felt better, so I said goodbye to Dr. Mishra and took my place in the back seat of Gopal's tiny red Maruti Suzuki hatchback. For the next few days, I lugged camera equipment and followed Dr. Matsuzaka and Gopal to numerous houses whose owners apparently had manuscripts related to Ayurveda. I had seen pictures of palm leaf and paper manuscripts from India before this, online and in my Sanskrit classes. But on this short adventure, I learned a little about the culture of medical manuscripts in Kerala. I discovered, for example, that the contents of many of the manuscripts we saw were relatively unknown to their owners, save perhaps their titles, and sometimes even their titles weren't known. Most were heirlooms, and many of the people we met simply had no interest in learning about, much less studying them. Moreover, Given the general lack of awareness, I was surprised to learn that many people were reluctant to let us even see their collections. Some wouldn't allow us to photograph individual texts, while others simply prohibited us from opening the cabinets where they kept their manuscripts. Gopal, a 20-something Malayali, suggested that the most taciturn and apprehensive people were often under the impression that there might be valuable information in these texts, especially now that a team of researchers showed interest in them. What if some terrific cures that haven't yet been performed or developed were in them? If they released that data, they might not reap the potentially lucrative benefits of that knowledge, Gopal surmised. Soon after my excursion with Dr. Matsuzaka, I caught a train north to Banaras, or multiple trains. When I got there, I spent three days at one of the city's oldest manuscript libraries. Though there was plenty of bureaucratic rigmarole to see the text I needed, I had more access and generally a freer exchange of information with the administrators there than I had with the private manuscript owners in Kerala. What's more, I was so struck by the space, the enormity of the collection, and the obvious care that went into collecting, categorizing, and preserving the store of texts, I requested permission from the library's director to take pictures of the place before I left. I wanted to have some documentation for myself of what I was seeing. Looking back now, I see that the manuscript library at this institution must have symbolized great potential for me. A graduate student aspiring to immerse himself in Indian texts, stories, and knowledge systems. This massive collection of knowledge, its history, and the challenge of finding my way, my way through even just a portion of it must have, even if only incipiently, betokened my future in some way. So I took dozens of pictures that day. And then, for the next several years, I went back to my philological project of reading and translating Sanskrit medical literature. While visiting manuscript libraries for this research, I continued to visually document the spaces, shelves, and manuscripts that I was seeing. I took pictures of aspects of the libraries and texts that I thought I might want to see again. I presume that others in Indology and South Asian studies would appreciate these sites too, and that they were likely taking snaps of their research sites just as I was even if it felt somewhat peripheral to the primary assignments like it did for me. I also thought the manuscript libraries were compelling sites in their own right, and the pictures I was taking might appeal to people who had no idea about the locations or the, the stuff in the photographs. Ever since those two experiences in Kerala and in Benares, I have been seeing and documenting the manuscript library as an art space. It wasn't until 2015, however, when I secured some funding to purchase new equipment and to support field work, that I was able to move what began as a keen interest into an official art slash research project that I be ca began calling Manuscriptistan. The title uses the Persian suffix stan, meaning place of or country, to evoke the region's rich linguistic history and millennia of handwritten manuscript cultures, hence 
Manuscriptistan, place of manuscripts, or manuscript country. Since the images I have taken thus far are restricted to three Indian states, the project cannot represent all of India. Yet the archives in Kerala, Telangana, and Uttar Pradesh, Kerala in the, oops, Kerala in the south, uh, Telangana in the, in the center there, and Uttar Pradesh to the north, <clears throat> uh, the archives in these three states that I have photographed are not, however, atypical in India. There are many other archives and manuscript collections across the country, and thus at a macro level, I imagine India itself as manuscriptistan. The obverse perspective, however, is also imaginable. Manuscriptistan could be contained within each archive, suggesting that the title of this project points to the manuscript library, a place of manuscripts, as a method with which to wrestle and make sense of the history of writing and book cultures in India before typography, and in this specific project, to query the aesthetic associations between functionality, context, and art objects. Manuscriptistan is thus both an old and a new project. I've been photographing manuscript libraries for about 17 years, I guess, all told, with a particular motivation in mind. On the surface, I want to visually capture the objects and spaces that I've been seeing while doing research in India. But underlying this aim is an impulse to aestheticize the Indian archive and manuscript in an effort to capture the feelings that arise in me when I see these objects and spend time in these spaces. The images of this project point to my responses to seeing shelf after shelf and pile after pile of bound and unbound palm leaf manuscripts, to walking through fluorescent lit spaces, inhaling musty, lemon grassy, and disinfecting odors, to searching for texts in tidy archives alive with human activity and in those that are hushed, tumbled down, and relatively unused. To do this, I have had to square a knee-jerk urge to objectify these objects and spaces as autonomously knowable and, is, and instinctively open to the interpretation and enjoyment of art students, authorities, and connoisseurs with an understanding of the context and usefulness of these objects and spaces that has and continues to inform my historical and philological training and commitments. Manuscriptistan is thus the outcome of the union of two kinds of appreciation that for a long time were seldom seen as complementary in discussions about what makes an art object the autonomous power of the object, and the object's context. This project attempts to aestheticize the Indian manuscript library and simultaneously acknowledge that the Indian manuscript qua art object, something visually pleasing, also inherently evokes cultural contexts of function and history. Most of the images in this project reflect the associations of makers of art, art objects, and viewers of art objects. This relationship triangle occupied Indian aesthetic theory, Rasa Shastra, for centuries. Deliberations in Rasa Shastra about how these relationships help us determine what makes something beautiful and how art makes people feel similarly inform the way I imagine Manuscriptistan as a potential counter to the tendency in art history books, especially books about Asian art, that Stanley O'Connor observed 25 years ago. These books, he wrote, quote, typically show no visible effort to establish Asian art objects' place, whether in the landscape or in the house, compound, palace, or monastery. They are placeless, viewed from nowhere, unframed by cultural practice or physical circumstance, and in thus are unworlded." End quote. By intending, intending for this project to be photoethnographic, I hope to avoid the art historical tendency to uncouple the viewer from the art object and curator slash user slash consumer of the art objects being viewed. I like to think, looking back now, that I was always taking pictures of Indian manuscript libraries with these pointed interests in mind. But the reality is that during my first decade of photographing manuscripts and libraries in India, I, simply, I was simply aware that I liked what I was seeing. And thus, whenever possible, I attempted to get permission to document those sites on film. But my first and most pressing charge was always to locate, possibly photocopy, in the days that they allowed photocopying, uh, and then read and translate particular texts. I went to manuscript libraries as a researcher first and foremost, in other words. Only after that work, and if the situation allowed for it, would I set up my tripod and cameras and shoot the shelves, aisles, walls, employees, and holdings of a library. The presence of my camera was never unusual in this context. Scholars often bring photography equipment with them to manuscript libraries in India, 
Oftentimes, the equipment is for reproducing specific leaves or pages of manuscripts related to a research project. These people want to bring the knowledge contained in manuscripts back home with them and study it. In general, since 2003, most people I have encountered in, in Indian manuscript archives have been there for one or a combination of three reasons. Because they work there, because they are potential donors and, for example, are being given a tour of the spaces and collections, or because they are visiting scholars who want access to the knowledge contained inside the text. They want to read those texts. The images of manuscriptistan that I conceive as most obviously ethnographic speak to the first group. These pictures recognize the constellation of people in India's manuscript cultures at the everyday and operational level. Some of these people are professors who use the libraries as spaces to teach students about manuscriptology and conservation. Others are career administrators with little or only superficial scholarly interest in what the texts in the libraries are actually about. Still others are custodial workers and security guards who clean and safeguard the collections to ensure they endure. The work of all these people supports the texts and the lives of the texts in turn impact these people's livelihoods. The people employed at these places are obviously and practically important to ongoing academic research that involves manuscripts. And at the end of the talk, I explain how and why the ethnographic component of this project is, in, is indispensable. So then what's noteworthy about the other two categories of libra manuscript library clientele? You see that man over there, a graduate student of manuscriptology at an archive in Kerala softly said to me in 2008, pointing to a handsomely dressed, gray-pated septuagenarian man being led around the library by its senior conservator. The in-charge is trying to get him to donate his private collection of palm leaf manuscripts to our library. He's a retired scholar from Alipura, and he apparently has over 100 of them. They would improve our kavya, or poetry collection, which is not very big right now. That library, I learned, already had an abundance of medical, astrological, and grammatical manuscripts. To boost its humanities holdings was seen as a potential coup to bring a wider range of scholarly attention to the library. More attention could, in turn, result in funding and preservation projects, possibly. Over the past 16, 17 years, I've also seen local politicians touring university manuscript libraries in Kerala and Uttar Pradesh. A few presumably wealthy philanthropists in archives in Telangana, and any number of curious tourists. All of these people took tours and marveled at the manuscripts for the diverse and towering local uh, and national histories of learning they embody. I presume, though I can't verify, that many of these people donated some money to the institutions at the end of their tours, or in the case of the politicians, pledged to lend their support to the archives' efforts to upkeep their collections. The third category has been my category for many years. I was, and still am, a student of Indian medicines and religions. And at times, manuscripts have been crucial to my research, sometimes to understand how different manuscript traditions have been standardized by editors and translators, <coughs> and translators in critical editions, and other times because no printed editions of texts I've needed existed. But I was also always taking pictures, and now on reflection, if the origin of manuscript of Stam was in 2003, I have also always been straddling a novel fourth category of manuscript library clientele. People in this fourth category see the archive as art. The aims motivating people in this category, though I can only speak for myself, are what I'd like to explore now. Manuscriptistan exhibits encourage viewers to think about the manuscript library and archive as, in a very dictionary definition kind of way, a place where public records or other important historic documents are kept. But I would also like the images to reframe the way we look at the archive and library by asking viewers, can the manuscript library and manuscript be art? As the project title illustrates, Manuscriptistan is concerned with particular types of historic documents held in archives and libraries, manuscripts books, texts, or other documents that were composed by hand. The early history of writing in South Asia invites us to consider ways of imagining writing, literature, and book cultures that differ from these arts as they are taught, usually taught and understood in schools in the United States today. For example, most of the manuscripts I have photographed are of a special kind. Palm leaf manuscripts arranged in what's known as a bundle form that has a number of folios of similar size pressed between two wooden panels slightly larger in size than the folios. They typically have one or two holes bored in them through which a cord is passed to tie the bundle. 
But palm leaf manuscripts are not the only objects on display. There are also plenty of images of paper manuscripts, not to mention modern style books, municipal documents, maps, and people in the project's presentations and exhibitions. Hand handwritten manuscripts started to appear in South Asia before the turn of the Common Era. B.S. Kesevan argued that there was likely manuscript style writing in South Asia as early as the fifth century BCE in the earliest layers of the Pali Canon. It's actually difficult to pinpoint when scribes in South Asia began writing texts, or more accurately, inscribing texts with metal and wooden styluses on dried birch bark, palmyra, and talipot palm leaves, and classical Indian languages like Pali, Sanskrit, and Tamil. Manuscript editions were pr produced and reproduced in this way for centuries, mostly with just text, but occasionally with images, some in black and white, and some with simple coloring. Today, archives and libraries across South Asia contain countless manuscripts of varying quality and age. The holdings of each one of these spaces offers a glimpse into the linguistic, religious, and cultural diversity of the region. This project is a visual study of manuscripts and archives only in India, where the National Mission for Manuscripts in New Delhi estimates that roughly seven million manuscripts are stored. Scholars have proposed a much larger figure, anecdotally at least, taking into account manuscripts in public and government libraries as well as those in private collections. For instance, I have seen projections go as high as 30 million. By either count, somewhere between seven and 30, Indian manuscript collections contain a lot of information about cultures and histories of India and its neighbors. Even still, most of the manuscripts have not been read or formally studied in recent decades, and as a result, the condition of many of them is poor. The lifespan of a paper manuscript is generally thought to be about two centuries be before it becomes illegible, and so brittle that it can't be handled. A palm leaf manuscript usually lasts much longer. Of course, the longevity of a manuscript, paper or palm, depends largely on the climate in which it's stored. And some archives in India, at least some of the ones that I've visited, cannot financially sustain climate-controlled rooms with non-damaging lighting. And in these circumstances, manuscripts, many of these manuscripts, especially the paper ones, today are in danger of soon becoming unreadable. The size of India's manuscript stock, the import of the information these works contain, and the value of that information for countless groups of people prompted the Indian Ministry of Tourism and Culture in 2003 to create the National Mission for Manuscripts, which goes by the acronym NAMAMI, with the express purpose of finding India's manuscript collections and preserving them through large-scale digitization projects. It's a slow venture, but the project will preserve important cultural and scientific knowledge for posterity and future study. It is already making available its ever-growing database online, which presents enormous benefits for scholars of South Asia, as well as anyone interested in Indian history and culture. The literary ideas, philosophical arguments, poems, scientific speculations, and much more recorded in all of these manuscripts needs to be preserved, and they should be available to everybody who would like to read them. The Manuscriptistan project is, somewhat curiously I realize, a digital visual project that attempts to draw out and compensate for some of the downsides of a massive digital humanities effort to preserve Indian knowledge like the one Namami has been doing. Images in Manuscriptistan offer insights into some of the ways that the National Digitization Project changes people's modes of engagement with the history of writing, reading, and research in India. The photographs are meant to evoke aesthetic aspects of manuscripts and places that hold them. They invite us to ask, when knowledge becomes the singular object of interest in our studies of the history, development, and transmission of scientific and literary forms, such as Kavya, Jyotisha, Nataka, Ayurveda, and others, and that knowledge is stripped of its physical casings and locations of reference, then digitized and made available online, how does that reconfiguration impact the way we receive that knowledge? Put another way, how does a hands-on engagement with the manuscript impact the way we understand, explain, and use the knowledge it expresses. Without contact with the physical object, how does the digitization process help us explore the life of the text, including how it might have been used and where it might have circulated, or even appreciate the conservation work that might have gone into it before we get our hands on it? This project asks, as Benjamin Fleming recently did, is a manuscript something that we can ever think of without material properties? Indeed, we are already doing that in the Indian context. 
and it's happening elsewhere around the world. As manuscript libraries are digitized, their collections are decontextualized from the physical spaces they inhabited and recontextualized to meet requirements for online presentation and access. In the process, the loss of the physical text in its space produces a number of consequences for research that involves manuscripts and manuscript libraries. And I'd like to consider what this loss might mean in aesthetic terms. Before I do this, however, I think it's important to pause just to reflect, say two things. First, I don't see digitization of India's manuscripts as a setback. Namami's work has been and continues to be vital to the preservation of Indian history. What is more, there are exceptional digital resources available today that can make the complex appreciation and understanding that emerges from the engagement with physical manuscripts relatable and shareable with large audiences virtually or online. Here I think about the work of Fla uh, Flavio Marzo at the British Library and Dot Porter's Viscal project right here at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, which preserve and, in a sense, reestablish some of the experience of actually handling the physical objects when viewed virtually. The amount of metadata about each object that is publicly accessible on databases of Indian manuscripts varies quite a lot. And some of the techniques that preservationists and librarians are using to digitize manuscripts elsewhere around the world are not always matched in online Indian archives. More of this technology and metadata will only improve the use of these resources. Second, I do not imagine Manuscriptistan as a nostalgic project. Two important goals of the work are to document collections of physical objects in institutional spaces and to invite viewers to consider them as art objects in art spaces. The manuscripts and archives have not gone away with the advent and progress of digitization projects. It may happen that the digitization of certain manuscript libraries will bring them fame, and an increase in requests for digital access to certain collections might bring better funding to the archives that maintain those texts, thereby ex extending the longevity of the objects and the spaces. Though it is impossible for me to predict or guarantee the reactions of viewers of the Manuscriptistan exhibits and publications, these photographs are meant to do more than inspire reveries. They are intended to call to mind the things that one encounters in a manuscript library that are not reproducible digitally, namely the aesthetic textures of archives. The images are meant to prompt a sensibility in the viewer by framing what you see when you visit an Indian manuscript library, browse its collections, speak with the employees there. It is a documentary of a researcher's experiences, the substances of archival spaces, and the physical qualities of manuscripts that, in my own experience at least, engagement with manuscripts on a computer screen alters and sometimes omits. But I do not want to communicate through the images of this project that a longing for the work of the researcher of manuscripts never to change, not to go virtual or online globally. What then are some of the aesthetic consequences of digitization schemes? A major effect, I think, of digital preservation is the reduction of the physical mise en scene of the archive. Removal or erasure of the material environment of the archive obscures the checks and constraints that have been imposed on manuscripts through taxonomic assignment, which affects their probability of use by ordering archivists and readers' relationships with them. While it is true that online databases of scans of Indian manuscripts rework classificatory structures, and our bodily proximities to them, for many people, if not most, these changes are appreciated. We no longer have to travel to India to access many of the te texts we need to do our research, which saves a lot of time and money. Our, our searches can be more precise now, too. Using Namami's database, for example, you can do multi-pronged advanced searches by title, author, script, manuscript material, commentator, commentary title, or even by location by state, city, district, and institution. But these classifications express a different logic than the ones in the spaces that were built to hold the manuscripts. The physical structures that literally support the manuscripts aren't visible. There are no ladders alongside wooden and metal shelving, no overhead tube lights, no glass cases displaying a collection's esteemed assets. The placement of manuscripts in each archive is the product of idiosyncratic, sometimes innovative, and sometimes routine decisions of a series of directors and administrators. The decisions of online archiving might be like this as well, but the digital collection is the product of a total reimagining, reorganization, and coalescing of archival spaces that, materially, are anything but uniform from library to library. 
Some spaces that I visited for this project are orderly, uncluttered, and replete with visual categories of classification that more or less match the classical knowledge systems of Indian intellectual history. Others appear to have little to no outwardly noticeable organization, requiring a conversation with the library staff to know what the archive contains and where the texts that you'd like to see are located. We don't have any categories, one archivist told me in a library in Kerala. Texts are numbered when we receive them, and they are placed on the shelves according to the date they arrived at the library. We recently reorganized this library so that the oldest texts are at the back on the highest shelves. However, she continued, we also keep some in this glass display over here because they're rare and beautiful. At larger libraries, with a simple numerical convention, library staff may also tag each manuscript with metadata on the binding of the manuscript itself <clears throat> and or in their files to mark each work's general field. And these categorizations will periodically be published as a catalog of the collection's holding. Some libraries arrange their manuscripts according to language of composition. A few places I visited were not organized in any noticeable way. Perhaps, perhaps it was by the material substrate of the manuscript, paper, palm leaf. Others appeared as though any organization of their collections had been suspended quite some time before I arrived. Digitization does not account for, but often obscures or ignores the architectural and spatial aesthetics of the archive. Shelves of palm leaf text stacked from floor to ceiling, sometimes wrapped in cl colorful cloth bundles, are telescoped into URLs that belie their impressive and sturdy histories as repositories of knowledge. Online pictures of manuscripts are often edited for clarity, with measuring scales placed alongside their leaves to show how they are, how big they are in real life. When we work with these materials on our computers, naturally, we do not have to dust off the manuscripts uh, that have sat unused for some time, nimbly hold together crumbling pieces of leaves, or carefully avoid inhaling mold spores while we inspect and read them. This is a routine experience at some manuscript libraries in India. It's a material experience that points to the life and usage of a text even before it's been studied. Even if this experience doesn't obviously or immediately influence a translation or analysis of the text, it nevertheless frames the reader's perception of the text and informs his or her understanding and appreciation of Indian manuscript cultures today. The tacit digestion of that information can emerge later on, in one's teaching, for example, or in a photoethnography project like Manuscriptistan. In a modest way, this project aims to curb some of this material erasure by making these spaces visible and, in so doing, providing prompts for discussion about preservation, digitization, and contemporary engagement with literature and a past that's contained in manuscript form. I also want this project to challenge us to confront, to see, and to think about manuscripts and archives as visual objects and sites as such, aside from their content. I do not want to deny that the images of this project are about India's past its pre-typography recording and transmission of knowledge. They are. But that meaning is del deliberately opaque. First and foremost, the images are meant to help the viewer appreciate what it feels like to be around these works and in these buildings and to see these archival spaces, storage structures, and still life images of the manuscript and manuscript library as functional art objects and spaces. While the images do convey socio-historical information, about manuscript storage and conservation, for example, that these images also incite responses in me that are epi-intellectual, not entirely logical or sober, but bordering, bordering on affective and enthralling, puts in stark relief for me that what I am doing, what this project does, is also intimately personal in visible ways that many of my other professional pursuits are not. Creating, editing, and framing an exhibit like the one downstairs of 62 photographs out of thousands of images from multiple archives, for example, reveals more than my style of writing might, the way I structure an argument, and the rationale for why I opt to do the work that I do. This project reveals some of these things, I suppose, but it also reflects something more, something different, my own taste, or what classical Indian literary theorists call rasa. It especially displays my faculty for judging, a phrase that Immanuel Kant used to describe taste in his third major critique, the critique of judgment. Judgments of taste, Kant argued, determine whether or not something is beautiful. These are aesthetic determinations, and they are based on feelings of pleasure, which is precisely what gave him pause about them. 
They are prone to subjectivity and cannot amount to real knowledge, which for him was knowledge that could be linked to absolute and determinate concepts. The pleasure that comes from this kind of judgment, he said, derives from, quote, the freedom to make for ourselves an object of pleasure out of something, end quote. Here, Kant's idea about taste <clears throat> are useful to explain how we can understand the Indian manuscript and manuscript library as art objects and spaces, I think. The freedom to make for ourselves an object of pleasure describes the process of the artist to make creative or poetic use of his or her productive imagination. Something, be something becomes beautiful when our productive imaginations make it into an art object by relating to it with creativity and or a poetic sensibility and thereby bringing us pleasure. The pleasure of aesthetic experience is problematic for Kant because it hangs on the chemistry of imagination and understanding in an individual and in this interplay cannot eventually be borne out by absolute and determinate concepts, thereby producing for him real knowledge. And yet, Kant also mounted a defense of creativity in the making of art that makes a new kind of sense and aesthetic ideas, both of which he thought surpassed the realm of universal concepts by enlivening the spirit. I brought together the images of this project as a way to build a sustained inquiry into a collection of responses I had in similar circumstances over many years. The images I ultimately selected to exhibit are naturally reflective of my own aesthetic judgments. I have aestheticized these objects and spaces, attempted to make them attractive or acceptable to so-called refined taste, to make them the subject of artistic treatment. The objects and spaces in the images bring me pleasure. And while I hope the ways I have framed, in all senses of that word, the pictures suggest the presence of beauty in these spaces and objects, and they are capable of striking people and eliciting responses of pleasure or displeasure, expectancy or disbelief, concentration or amusement, or some combination of these feelings and others, I cannot, as Kant understood it, compel assent to my viewers. The aesthetic judgments that have gone into this project might not amount to true universal knowledge in the Kantian sense. Kant was correct that aesthetic knowledge is subjective. And that's why aesthetic knowledge can be true knowledge and have value for at least a cohort of one. Mm. I do not expect others to respond to the images like I do, but I find solace in Kant's observation that people make judgments of beauty with the belief that other people will agree with them, suggesting that there is a sensus communis, a common aesthetic sense, a community of taste, where my judgments about beauty align with those of others. In this regard, it's worth noting that one of the things I most enjoy about doing this project is that even if I hope to tap into a community of like-minded people, Manuscriptistan is not aimed at a particular audience. Since 2015, I have shared many of the project, project's images. Two of the images were published last year in, the, in this photography journal, Light, and those are the ones that were published. Now there's this exhibit here at Penn, and from January to May, some of the images will hang in the Chazen Museum of Art in Madison. This material will reach many people I will never know. Of course, a lot of academic research operates like this, and scholars cannot predict who will and who will not take up the things they write, or for that matter, how readers will respond if they do. But unlike most of the things I write, which are, I imagine, mostly picked up by South Asianists and maybe others interested more broadly in the historical study of medicine and religion, but most likely it's an academic audience, these images will also reach people unconnected to South Asian studies in academia. The viewer response to beauty is an important aspect of the Manuscript of Stan project, although it's something I feel I cannot adequately address until I have presented the work more widely. The Indian theorist Bhattanayaka, 9th, 10th century, argued that the only genuine response to beauty is complete absorption, where the subject experiences the pleasure of a consciousness untouched by the things of this world. I'm not suggesting that the images in this project are otherworldly. They are not, nor are they mundane, however, especially not in the lives of most Indians today, and it's quite likely they never were. A hope I have for this project is to convey some visual insights about how and where Indian historical data and ideas have been assembled, while at the same time providing images that evoke the weightiness and substance of learning and history, however these things might feel for viewers, irrespective of their prior knowledge of India or Indian manuscript cultures. By way of conclusion, I would like to return to the ethnographic part of the project. 
I see the people at every manuscript archive I have visited to be part and parcel to the artistic value of the images I've produced. Their relationships to the texts and spaces contribute to the contextual aesthetics of the project. The images I exhibit are intended to at once evoke sentiment and convey information about people, places, and writing. This theme is present <clears throat> in many of the images I've created since 2003, but it was only in 2015 that I began to make a concerted effort to approach each archive with an aim to also document and present some of the people who manage the spaces where manuscripts are held, people whose livelihoods are influenced by and connected to the archives. These people have stories about the collections and relationships to them that unsurprisingly differ from my own and those of other scholars I know who work in these kinds of places. They literally hold the keys to these spaces, and without fail, they query me about why I want access to specific manuscripts or permission to photograph their libraries. Needless to say, it was a challenge to get into several of the archives I photographed. In some cases, I needed multiple connections and introductions from people in positions of power just to get access. And even when it seemed like I had been equipped with an arsenal of institutional affiliations and signatures, there were never guarantees of admission. Entry into private collections was often just as elusive without the proper people to vouch for me. In a somewhat unexpected turn of events, in a few instances that I gained access to an archive with permission to do a photo shoot, there was more curiosity about my intentions than in the past when I wanted to read and photocopy specific texts. People were suspicious about why I didn't want access to the knowledge in the text. But that was not always the case. Take, for example, the archivist in Kerala in 2016 who pulled me by the arm through her collection, excitedly saying, I just placed a stack of newly arrived palm leaf manuscripts on a bench over here. They're in beautiful condition, not yet cataloged. Come, come see them. This woman became my partner on that photo shoot, pointing out the best angles for light as she invited me to take pictures of her posing with manuscripts opened in her hands, resting in stacks in her arms, and as she stood alongside the shelves of the library. Conversely, a team of four curators at an impressive collection of manuscripts in Uttar Pradesh shadowed my every move through their library in 2017. All of their manuscripts were padlocked behind glass and were unreachable to me without their assistance. You have only 10 minutes, the archivist in charge quickly established when I entered. He and his three co-workers shepherded me through this 200 plus year old building as I snapped as many pictures as possible and chatted with them in the hopes of securing more time. How many, how many visitors do you get here each day? I asked as 10 minutes seemed to loom. Lots of scholars come here, even from abroad, though some days no one comes at all, answered the worker I presume to be the youngest of the bunch. They usually come to look at one or two of these texts, maybe to make copies of them. <clears throat> but they must have special permission from the director to see them. I understand, I said. Is it easy to get permission to see these texts? No, the in-charge shot back, checking his watch. How many more photographs will you take? As many as you'll allow, I said, and then asked the foreman for a picture of them next to the large wooden reading table in the middle of the archive. As they got situated, two sat, two stood, and I learned that the senior curator had been working at this archive for 26 years. He didn't study manuscriptology or, preser or conservation, as the two junior employees under him did. He worked at the library his entire adult life after getting a degree in Sanskrit literature. His ability to read and, and at least glean the basic thrust of many of the manuscripts the library received every year moved him from acquisitions jobs up to the position of head archivist. When I told him that I, too, had studied Sanskrit for several years, he asked, then why are you only taking pictures of the shelves and outsides of the manuscripts, even ones in cloth bags? I am interested in some of, the, uh, some of what these texts actually say, I said. But I also find this place, the way it's organized, and the impressive collection of manuscripts to be beautiful. Don't you? I asked. All four of the curators looked at me, shrugged their shoulders, and doubtingly then glanced at each other. In 2015, at a small archive in Kerala, I was left alone to shoot all the pictures I wanted, to open window blinds, to adjust the lighting, and to ask the students studying in the adjoining reading room for help if I needed it. Before I left that day, the head archivist gave me his contact information and a pamphlet about the library, seemingly uninterested in what I was doing. While I've been in the field, this is all to say, responses to the project have been very wide ranging. In the end, I owe a great deal of thanks to the many people who have assisted me since the project's inception. The archivists, catalogers, and preservationists who have taken the time to walk me through the spaces and explain the holdings of their histories, 
the professors and students of manuscriptology who have shown me the nuances of different manuscript cultures in Indian history, the office administrators and security guards who have kept the lights on for me when I overstayed my welcome, and the friends and colleagues who have accompanied me to some of the libraries in these images, and so crucial to this project, occupied the workers with conversation and questions while I stole away into the stacks and lesser used corners to try to get just the right shot. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Anthony, for a really great talk, for your really compelling images, and for prompting this opportunity to think more deeply about um, the role of the archive and our consideration of the archive. Um, we want to follow up now with a panel discussion that I hope broadens the conversation to other areas of South Asia and to other types of archival spaces. Um, Taren Sevilla, coming back, is uh, assistant professor in the Department of South Asia Studies. Shashi Elowat is a PhD student in South Asia Studies. Uh, Megan Robb is assistant professor in religious studies, and then myself. And each of us will offer some uh, reaction to Anthony's work, some reflection on our own experiences in quote unquote archival spaces, broadly defined, and we'll offer some, of, uh, some thoughts on the value of considering the archive from aesthetic and or ethnographic perspectives. Thank you so much, uh, by the way. I'm really excited to see the exhibit, and I was really fascinated by the talk. I'm a social and cultural historian, and I look at texts both discursively and from the point of view of how their materiality informs us reading them as texts. And so I'm coming at the talk from that direction, where I often see both the form of texts and their discursive content as working together. So it's a very useful and challenging exercise for me to think about what happens when we try to pull them apart. And this is part of what is shaping some of my reactions. I think, um, I, first, I, I'd really be interested in talking a little bit about what happens when we do tease those things apart. Because I think emphasizing aesthetics as a pathway into the archive is a really apt lens through which to explore current limitations of the academic archive. For me, that's one of the most exciting things about this type of project. Because, because of course, in an age of digitization, actually, I should probably time myself, because I can just get going. Um, in an age of digitization, I think we need more attention given to the fact that certain types of organizing knowledge and embodying knowledge are at risk of being lost. So current uh, efforts by reikfa.org, for instance, and the Endangered Archives Project that is founded by the British Library are giving a lot of funding and attention to digitizing archives, but no funding or attention to the work of preservation. So what's happening, for instance, with the private library of the royal family of Mahmudabad is reikfa.org has digitized the entire collection, but the physical collection itself is kind of crumbling into dust. And the same sort of trend is happening with endangered archives um, materials as well. So there's an increased attention to digitization and actually a decreased attention to preservation because of the expense of it, the expense of training operatives who are actually, it requires a great deal of skill, of course, to determine how to preserve um, a delicate manuscript. So one thing I found this exhibition really useful to spark for me is thinking about first what's potentially being lost, but also in from the perspective of digital archives, what are the types of attempts to try to preserve some of this lost knowledge in the archiving process. So I'm currently doing uh, working on a project with Sneha Krishnan at Oxford called Unstable Archives, which is attempting to curate digital archives of women's materials, which are often held in very closely guarded family archives which for many reasons, families don't want to actually separate themselves from for long periods of time. So we're working on a prototype model of shepherding the materials temporarily to the Bodleian Library in Oxford, photographing them, and then shepherding them back into the family archives, which is extremely time consuming, of course, because it requires a lot a long-term investment um, in relationships and trust building um, to get access to some of these delicate materials. Other types of strategies that we run, that Sneha and I have run across in our exploration of uh, digital archives is the 1947 Partition Archive, which overlays archival material onto images of maps. 
suggesting in a really important way the importance of always looking at archival content in context of its geographic place. So each time you pull up an archival piece of material in the 1947 archive, you're actually seeing it overlaid or placed onto a physical map. But then on the other hand, the map itself is extremely um, conventional in the sense that it's defined by contemporary nation state boundaries. And so Professor Anuradha Mathur, who I don't suppose happens to be here, does she? She's at the University of Pennsylvania in the School of Design. Her online curated project, Soak an Ocean of Rain, explore how through forms of aesthetic representations, which I think is what's really fascinating, she thinks about rethinking the formerly accepted as logical definition of the boundary between land and sea in the South Asian context. Through, so through screen print work, alongside academic writing. She's actually re-visualizing and also trying to re-revise our understandings of the colonial project of map making that assumed that there needed to be a firm definition between land and sea. And her, um, her artworks, which are available open access online, actually, um, they, attend, they make an attempt to recover what she calls these lost ge geographies of space. Um, so bringing into mapping not simply uh, spatial records of borders between land and water, but also bringing in temporal concerns of how festivals and the time of year determines the relationship between land and sea. She also suggested in her talk a couple of years ago that um, we should question our over-dependence on material manuscripts as repositories of knowledge. And she suggested that maybe we should just let the manuscripts do what they will, sink back into the climate of South Asia and consider different ways of preserving and perpetuating knowledge, which I found to be a very radical approach as a social and cultural historian, but also brings to mind the ways that our reverence for material texts is also in some ways conditioned by our fondness of a material item as being a very um, reliable source compared to other ways of um, recording knowledge. Also, uh, I just wanted to bring up one more local kind of attempt to re-envision re knowledge in the form of a digital archive. The Weizmann School of Design here has done a digital analysis of the latent topological structures of Baroque architecture. Has anyone seen that? It's beautiful. They do digital topology scanning techniques to read buildings in profoundly different ways that seem very eerie and almost alien. And that's a good example for me of a digital archive that kind of glories in the strange, makes no attempt to actually try to capture what it feels like to be in the building, but instead, almost in, a, in a, an abstract interpretive sense, tries to detach the object from its context and turn it into more of an aesthetic object. So it could be a really interesting comparative example to think about alongside your work. So these are some of the thoughts that came to mind, that bubbled up when I was looking at your uh, description of um, the, the exhibition and listening to your talk today. And to conclude, I would love to talk more about what I know that I would just love to continue to explore with you. What is at stake when we think about aesthetics as one of the primary pathways into the archive? And this is an honest question because I'm kind of grappling with it as well. To approach an object as an object of beauty when there's clearly in the ethnographic work differences of opinion about whether something is primarily beautiful or whether it is primarily functional. Does seeing an, an archival object as an object of beauty necessarily require a decontextualization or is there an obligation to um, kind of double down on the contextualization when we're considering things as aesthetic objects to resist the temptation to kind of um, divorce the object from its geogra geographic space? Thank you very much. Uh, Karen, do you need to, do you want to go next? Why don't you go and then whenever you need to run and relieve your <laughs> right. from uh, responsibilities and take over the class. All right, great. Hi. Thank you. Sorry, I guess I should be audible enough. Yes, thank you. So Jeff, uh, Jeff has said that this would be rather informal, so I hope you don't mind me saying Anthony instead. I would describe you as, yes, um, so I really appreciate and appreciated Anthony's paper and the way he took us into this world of Manuscriptistan and and you, at some point, you said that this was the manuscript, manuscriptistan, sorry, 
I struggle to say some things. But you, you even went to the extent of introducing India as this world of manuscript is on. And uh, I, I mean, of course, you took us down to the nitty gritty of the archive, the world of secrecy, reticence, the bureaucracy, these issues you dealt with. And uh, what, what I found in the description was how you opened up the discussion very, very crucially for us to think of how we would consider space of manuscripts and the text itself and consider questions of functionality, form, and context. And there was a way you were relating this. And, and my, my first concern, and I'm, I'm going to be looking at the clock to make sure I'm on time, so my first concern came following up from what just Megan raised. And I was thinking in a way that you were... You were in, in your work, I mean, in the photo ethnographic approach here you were taking, there was this concern largely of dealing with form and aesthetic, but never, as you said, neglecting context. And, but I think Megan's question was kind of pushing us again to, to, to get back to this question. And I, when I was listening to your work, I was thinking of Carolyn Levine's work on form, where there was an interactive idea of, of dealing with form in literary traditions, where for that matter, through interacting with form in literary traditions or literature, there was this certain, uh, there was the audience of that form would, would, be, would become much more sensitive to the historical, social historical context that the audience operated with. And I was, I was, I was hoping that perhaps I could push you to speak much more about that, if that's possible. And now, where I was getting to was that now, in thinking about this, and I mean, there are a couple of things I want to go across, but I'll start with the digitalization project. And, and you said this digitalization of knowledge. And like Megan, I mean, one of the things that I've been concerned about in this digitalization project, and I'll link it back to my earlier form, of form is what's being lost here. I mean, and I, I'm partly much more conversant with Malay manuscript traditions on the other end of the Bay of Bengal. And what's happening with the Sumat, there's been, they've been, I've been involved in a few Malay concordance projects that are, are working on digitalizing manuscripts in Sumatra, parts of Riau, and parts of the Malay Peninsula in Java. And what's, what's, what's of primary concern to us, of course, is what's being lost here also. Of course, at times, I mean, with, with the funding coming in, there's the physicality of the text is being neglected. Beyond that, what is also a primary concern, I think, in these projects of digitalization, and I think everybody involved, and I wanted to know your opinion on how you deal with this, is this increasing cognizance of the fact of collecting history. So most of the texts that I deal with were products of the 18th, 19th century. I mean, beyond the palm leaf manuscripts that have survived, I mean, the paper manuscripts have totally dissolved. So the 18th, 19th century uh, texts are reproductions of earlier manuscripts. And these were largely produced in very, very diverse socio-political contexts, whether they were courtly initiatives, whether they were colonial initiatives. And there's this cognizance of the fact of the socio-political context beyond the form. So even in reading the text, as Levine would invite us, is which should make us even more sensitive to the collecting history of the text, and in a way, if we're paying attention to the aesthetics very seriously. Now, beyond that, I mean, in this work of digitalization, I hope I'm not ranting, I'm making sense here, and is that, ram sorry, I mean rambling, not ranting, is that in the work of digitalizing here, in a weird way, we are involved in that project of, of collecting histories. We are part of that. We are adding on to that long history of what was lost or what was codified. And this is something I would like to know your reflections on it and um, to know what, what you do there. Now, but I will move on from there to the other point that I'm getting to, is that I, I really appreciated the way you, through your photo ethnographic approach, you were on one hand telling us of how your effect was central to the work of reading these manuscripts, digitalizing them. But beyond that, you were drawing our attention to the people in the archives, their relationships with the text. And you mentioned all kinds of actors from the, the guards down to people who helped you on a daily basis, turned on the lights, down to the politicians who walked into the archive. And this is, this is something that, again, I mean, getting back to, if we are taking the text as a form, and perhaps if I beseech your permission to actually draw my own research a bit, something I'm more familiar with, is I, I work on uh, Malay manuscripts that were tra transmitted by, by Sufi masters, miracle workers from the 18th, 19th. These were texts that were transcribed in the 18th, 19th century. They contained charms, uh, healing formula, genealogies, demonologies, this kind of material. But they were lastly transcribed in the 18th, 19th century. Now, one of the things that I found when we are dealing with the form, and, and this goes back to the question of embodiment of it, is that we, 
I, I mean, to, perhaps I can explain what I'm saying through anecdote, is that even though I took, I would make copies of these manuscripts in terms of photographs, or I would transcribe these manuscripts when I found them in, for the matter, in the colonial archives or something, if they were stored in colonial archives, I found that there were longer traditions in which these manuscripts were transmitted. So I would be sitting down with descendants of these Sufi masters who had transmitted this manuscript at some point in the 17th, 18th, or 19th century, and reading these manuscripts with them. And what I would realize is that there, there, are, there is a lesson to be learned on how to, these manuscripts should be read also. I mean, it's humbling because on one hand, you realize that we're not omniscient observers of these manuscripts because these figures who are reading these manuscripts are very concerned of the fact that before they even read a word of the manuscript, they go through all kinds of purification rites down to all kinds of rituals of, of that they have, they've devoted years of their life to. Now, when I went in with whether it was a digitalized copy of the manuscript or something on an iPad, I was often reminded, no, stop. You don't do that, whether you're a believer or not, because I kept saying that I'm coming in as a historian. You have to partake in a ritual of remembrance now. Do you sit down for zakat or sit down for something, and then we get down to reading the manuscript, right? Or read the fatiha or something or some yeah. section. Now, beyond that, this text that we are dealing with and and what and it just gets back to the question of form, were very much for them still texts that were talismans. There was a talismanic quality to them. There were rituals involved around these texts. So there was a form of embodying knowledge that was central. And I, I know I'm speaking in terms of specific texts, but these also apply to the private collections and the non-colonial archives. So I would go to private collections, find these texts, and very quickly be reminded about the fact that perhaps when you're working as collectors of manuscripts, which I am culpable of, and I'm speaking from my own culpability, when we're dealing as collectors of manuscripts, as historians of manuscripts, as study as, as students of textual traditions, we often are disembodying these texts also. And that's something that I was constantly reminded in this world of reading the things. Now, uh, of course, I mean, the, there's, um, oops, I think I, sorry, I've just gone over time. Uh, I, I, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> sorry, I mean, I had a few more points, but I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. And feel free to go whenever you need to turn and take over your <laughs> Yes, I'll just <laughs> do uh, you, do you want to stand here or speak to me? Yeah, that would be good. Um, uh, thank you for the amazing talk, and I really enjoyed your exhibition setup. This, uh, what brought uh, that for me was my own experience in the field, and I deal with material culture, which means I go to villages, document uh, stone images, artifacts, or mounds in villages. Uh, so I have a very different sense of archival space, where it is laid out there, where the materiality of object is very much out there. Um, and I want to draw from some of the stone images where you again see the aesthetic part is very right there. So what do, what do these images or taking photograph of these images are doing for me or when I'm presenting it to you guys, what is that doing for you is what I want to focus on. Um, this is um, the, a couple of images in the beginning are from the uh, museum, and my intention behind that was sort of to talk about what what when you when some we find the images in a decontextualized space, what is that doing for us, and uh, do we feel a sort of kind of comfort seeing them as preserved or a sense of a distant distance? from the image because these are decontextualized. And in the same case, when, when these are found in villages, where, uh, again, the spatial context has changed over time, what is that doing for, for a scholar who is going as the person who is the other or the intruder in the space? Um, and I also want to talk about sort of like, um, for, for us to reflect on the, our own positionality in the space where we could be going in as someone, uh, a woman wearing fedora hat, maybe your cargo pants and standing out, or a foreigner who is uh, being sort of, who is without doing anything is kind of like a center of the attention, or um, any local who is being poked by the villagers uh, because their land has been taken away for another excavation site. It's not moving. 
I can do this. Okay. Yeah. Um, so images which were uh, uh, which could be standing in villages, and it could be very uh, be, this being a hero stone image could be, and this from Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, which could have been in their context very religious or some uh, sort of bringing in remembrance, the, remembrance those kind of artifacts are now decontextualized in muse a museum space or archival space here. And in contrast to this, um, going back to village temples, where we assume that these images are in their context, but they are, again, can be seen in sort of an archival and co constructed archival space, um, where cu your curators could be villagers, village priests, who have their so own sense of aesthetics behind how they are going to organize the, these stone images in a temple. And here, um, I want to reflect on um, the kind of sense that these images um, arouse in a researcher's mind, which could vary from being um, that um, the, these are not well preserved, what can we do about this? Should these be taken out of the village temples? Or can we somehow ask villagers <laughs> to stop putting all these different uh, elements uh, that are part of ritual um, on the stone artifact? or just let, let them be because these, these are probably the only spaces through which uh, we have come across these images in a very, but whatever stage they are at, they are in a preserved stage uh, compared to being, uh, still being buried in uh, village ponds or other places. And some of these are images that can give you a sense of um, the curatorship on uh, behalf of village priests or um, locals, uh, how, how they are deciding what images to go in the center or what images um, to stand outside uh, the temple. And then other spaces like where defragmented images are to be put together. Um, what, what, what is that telling us about um, the sense of aesthetics of, from the point of view of villagers. And in other cases, um, these could be images, um, these could be stone images where the curatorship differs uh, for different audience. Um, th this is an example of a black Buddha ima uh, image in a, temp in a temple in Nalanda. And it is worshipped by villagers as a Hindu deity, but is now being curated by the village priest in a form of like if, as it is known to Westerners now as Black Buddha. So there are signs outside that tell you that um, this is uh, Teli Baba in Hindi and then um, Buddha in English. And, in, um, uh, and I also want to reflect on uh, images which we see as sort of covered in garlands and um, these ochre material and other um, objects. And what we as researchers are, what, what we do as um, when we are taking photographs is we ask the temple priest to kind of take these off and take our pictures um, with the measurement scales or whatever, define sort of our angles, what, what is the best angle for taking photographs. Are we then decontextualizing images in our own fashion? And finally, um, kind of my response uh, or sort of a posing question to the entire audience or to Professor Ali would be to consider photographs itself um, as a medium of expression, um, kind of the process that is involved behind, for example, editing process, how, how is that shaping um, our experience or more than our experience, experience the experience of audience who, who we are intending this to be for. Um, uh, and the decision choices that we are making, not just in editing process, but also in uh, how we are maybe send, send putting our object in the center or in the or in the side. If we are choosing to include uh, people or employers in employees in your case uh, in archive to be in the picture or not, um, and other in other ch uh, cases it could be choosing to take a wide angle picture 
how like how do I uh, make a choice of uh, taking a picture of an artifact in the field depends on if I'm doing it for the purpose of presenting it to an audience, what kind of audience that would be. It could be just taking a picture of that object alone with a scale maybe, but uh, for my own aesthetic purpose, how do I, when I want to document it for a longer term, I take wide angle pictures, which could be maybe have a sunset in the background and all those kind of images, but those ne never really get out, out of my hard disk. And your project reminds me of that, that that could be a process of its own. Uh, and I want to leave with this image where you might be confused, what is this about? And again, this is a reflection on what a, phot a photograph as a medium can do. Um, if taken from this angle, it tells nothing, but taking from this angle gives you an impression that this is part of a larger uh, a wall structure or something uh, and not just some rocks on the ground. Thank you. Thanks, Shashi. So much of what I wanted to say has been touched on, so I'll be brief, but um, one of the things that I wanted to one of the things that really resonated with me in the photographs um, are these shots that evoked a sense of inaccessibility. Um, manuscripts that are locked away behind glass doors or manuscripts that are thoroughly wrapped up with swaths of cloth and manuscripts tightly wound up with twine. Um, because this aspect of being withheld to some extent has marked a lot of my own archival experiences in South Asia, um, especially during my dissertation research in Bengal. Um, at the time, I was seeking manuscript copies of the Devi Purana and any associated texts, and I found the Sanskrit Sahitya Parishat in Kolkata to be of great benefit, but only after a series of trials that seemed to test my determination and thus my worthiness for access. Um, the tests began at the front gate itself, trying to figure out when the archive would be open, which largely depended on the fickle nature of its keepers. Um, on several occasions, I made the hour-long commute from my apartment only to discover that no one felt like coming into the archive that day. Um, then once through the gate, you have to convince the keepers that you're, um, you're deserving of gaining access to the archive, as, as you mentioned, demonstrating professional credentials, personal connections, reputable scholarship, and then completing all the necessary bureaucratic paperwork. Then once in, you think, hurrah, all the difficulties are over. Um, only to discover that actually locating the manuscripts you're seeking is going to be an arduous task. Um, at the Sanskrit Sahitya Parishat, for instance, manuscripts were simply listed in sets of notebooks, presumably in the order they had been accessioned. Um, so the cataloging logic didn't align with my expectations going in. Rather than simply typing in Devi Purana into a database and getting results within moments, I was forced to spend days scouring each notebook line by line looking for relevant entries. Then once I had the list of manuscript numbers that I wanted, um, they had to be retrieved from the shelves. That seemed chaotic to me as an outsider, but which made perfect sense to the archives custodians, as you've mentioned. Um, this difficulty of, of access that's reinforced by the aesthetic experience of the archives speaks to a different valuation of knowledge and expectations of knowledge availability. Um, knowledge isn't something to be freely open, but should only be imparted to those who demonstrate a respect for it and a capacity for understanding. All of the manuscripts at this particular archive, the Sanskrit Sahitya Parishat, were wrapped up in red cloth, as some of your photos have indicated, which to me really underscored the status of these manuscripts as repositories of knowledge, as treasured gifts. Unwrapping each one is like opening up something new and exciting, something honored, something that's transmitted from guru to disciple, not simply like grabbing a book off the shelf. Um, as Anthony, you've commented um, it previously, in such a system, knowledge is proprietary. It exists as part of this archive, this family, this institution. And our current trends to digitize and render these documents open access do away with this level of sheltering and control. And like you, I'm not saying that we eschew digitization, but rather recognizing that we do lose something meaningful as we push to modernize. Um, what we gain in open worldwide access and easy discoverability is counterbalanced by a loss of what we can learn in the process of seeking out physical manuscripts in uh, an archive that might be inaccessible in many ways. Uh, in my own experiences at the Sanskrit Sahitya Parishat, for example, my persistence in accessing this particular manuscript opened up new pathways of discovery. Simply acquiring access to the archive introduced me to new, to new networks of people and broached informative conversations. 
My line-by-line -line assessment of the archive's holdings in search of the Devi Purana made me aware of other manuscripts I might not have otherwise discovered. Um, and the sensory experience of working with this fragile manuscript leaf by leaf rendered the lineage of knowledge transmission tangible in ways that a digitized pro uh, product simply cannot. Working with the physical material object makes one feel more part of a tradition and subsequently more responsible for the knowledge contained therein. So in short, for me, Anthony's images invoke a sense of tradition and cultural heritage and also a deep respect for knowledge. As we've grown accustomed to finding answers to our questions online in a matter of seconds, the, the manuscript archive forces us to reposition our relationship with learning and our expectations for knowledge availability. Um, it's easy to take information for granted when it's so readily available, but when you must undergo a series of trials to demonstrate your suitability for knowledge access, it can mean that much more. So my first question, um, sort of directed to the panel, to Anthony, but open to, to all of us, is about how we move forward without losing sight of the past. South Asia has this very long scribal tradition of recopying manuscripts as they age, and I see digitization initiatives as our modern form of the courtly scribe. But as we digitize works, not only manuscripts, but also more recent periodi periodicals, ephemera, or even archeological remains and 3D objects, we thereby, as you say, de- and recontextualize them. But how might we try to preserve aesthetic histories? In other words, how might we create digital repositories that in some way tap into traditional modes of transmitting and archiving knowledge? So that's sort of a jumping off point. Um, do you mind joining us, since we have an empty chair up here, do you mind joining us and we can just uh, open it up for a broader discussion? Any thoughts about, <laughs> about that? How do we move forward? What, what do people think uh, uh, is the best strategy for, should we keep, lineage, keep this lineage alive? Do we continue uh, cutting back to the past? Or as you had mentioned, uh, Megan, this like very um, radical way of just let it rot and we'll have new <laughs> modes of transmission. <laughs> I'm not advocating that. I know, I know, but Laying as you out point out, yeah. As an option. Uh, these, are, these are all really tremendous uh, insights, and I'm happy to hear them. I think what's interesting for me in uh, having shared some of these images uh, gets to the question of function and context and the idea of an art object as something that's autonomously knowable that is open to art connoisseurs and students to simply sort of riff on and talk about and evaluate and assess is very different in the context of the audience who's looking at it. Right? And so coming here where I, I look around the room and I know a number of people, I don't know everybody obviously, but you know, if there are people who are familiar with South Asia and with manuscripts, it's a different conversation than it is, for example, when I've been at, uh, you know, at a photography shop talking about cameras and, and the photographs with people and who have no idea what they're looking at. And, mm -hmm. and um, the question of, of function and context, however, I think for me is inevitably joined uh, with these simply because of my commitments to the research that I do. Um, uh, Jeff, could you ask your, 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 your question um, that you, you asked was how to move forward without losing sight of, of the aesthetics of Yes, of this yeah, and, and the, um, I guess the, the uh, what those aesthetics represent. Um, the aesthetics of, for, for me, what spoke to me as the, the aesthetics of the, the inaccessibility and that like, um, guarding of knowledge. Uh, are there ways to, um, to speak to that in some way, or to recognize it at least, uh, in, a digital, in a digital repository? The, the, the two people I mentioned, um, I took out a big section of where I was describing the work of Flavio uh, Marzo at the British Library, and then the Viscal Project right here at the Schoenberg Institute have all sorts of different kind of lighting that can be added to an online engagement where you're not eliminating shadows, you can actually see wrinkles in the text, you know, which is something that I think for a long time, and the preservationists and conservationists in the room can correct me on this because I'm not coming from that field, gives the sense that, well, even while you're looking online, you can get a, you can get a feel, sort of, uh, you know, for what these things might have been like if you actually picked them up. So I think there's a lot of efforts to do that. Um, it's still different. Uh, obviously, especially if you've already had the experience of using them in a physical way. Mm. Uh, so I think it's hard, but I, obviously people are trying to do it, and I think that that's good. 
Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I don't see a lot of that in the Indian context yet. I don't know if it's coming. Um, these are people working with, with medieval European manuscripts, I think, actually. Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting because we're coming up against two very different um, uh, approaches to knowledge. I mean, we're pushing more and more from um, our perspective in the library of open access. You know, knowledge is open access to everyone, and how to have that jive with more traditional understandings of, of um, really needing to be part of a lineage and proving yourself. I mean, it's not, there's no easy answer. And this has come up in the context of Native American texts in the US context as well, right? Where certain knowledge is secret knowledge and one is supposed to demonstrate a kind of bona fides before having mm. access to it. Um, and I, I wish I had more specific details, but it brings up the same kind of um, evocative associations of what to do when the knowledge is supposed to be privileged, when it's contextualized. Um, I know that Anshal Malhotra, in her work on partition, has done an interesting approach by layering genres of work. So she does, she has physical objects, so it's not manuscripts, but she has physical objects that are used as a stepping off point, combined with oral histories, combined with academic work to try to recapture some of the texture. Mm. And that's one, one way that she's tried to, by layering different approaches, try to recreate some of that mm. texture that might be lost. And that could be, but, but this is something that's possible in the partition era, of course, because there are still people living who have that, who are repositories of that kind of knowledge. But one could envision a similar sort of project where oral histories of oral transmission of manuscripts sits alongside um, digital preservation of texts as a way to recapture some of that texture. Of course, I hope some of the images that I've taken, right? And, yes. and, and the publications, uh, <laughs> that the writings and the presentations can provide some of that too. Mm. Uh, but that's not always a, an option, right? So when these images are hanging there in art galleries, uh, people will receive them and however they receive them. Uh, hopefully they receive them in, in a way that inspires them in some way, um, I hope. Uh, but opportunities like this, you know, and writing opportunities provide you know, ways to bring that texture mm. you know, through the ethnographic stories, and there are lots of them. And without those stories, you know, the work that I've gone to these archives in the first place for would have never really happened. So the stories, the ethnographic stories of, of the spaces, of the functionality, and of the actual forms, uh, sort of pre, you know, um, they're the prologue to the, the research that I've been doing for many years. Can I ask about, yeah. um, just to complicate it a bit, in context of the, uh, the photoethnographic project or in, in your specific photoethnographic project, what do you think is the function of adding another layer of texture for by grayscaling the image or popping out some colors or in the conscious choice of, um, deciding how the layout is going to be for an image. What is the... What is that, that, like, by adding an extra layer of texture, are we then contradicting the purpose of bringing out the texture of the material itself in the image? What are we... Well, we can, we can perhaps gain something of the, you know, the experience of being with these things in a way that we couldn't if we're looking at them. I, I was actually comparing the images that you put out in the exhibition yeah. uh, and the images that you've used in your presentation. Yeah. Uh, your presentation images look very raw, and whereas your exhibition images look a little more sort of like exercised version of things. Yeah. Um, and do you think of the grayscale? Like, what what are the conscious choices you are making behind that? Yeah, they well, there were images that I wanted to see. They were images that I edited for my own my own aesthetic uh, pleasure. That, without a doubt, this is meant to be an be an art object, uh, each one of them. But when you come into this conversation in the South Asian context, then you can't extrapolate. I don't think I can the the function right of these and the histories and the socio historical. I'm not sure why they would be different up here necessarily, perhaps it's the screen, uh, but a lot of the images were exactly the same from the, the frames on the ground floor of the Sophia Collection. That actually makes me remember, uh, that makes me remember, uh, one person you talked to in the archives said, uh, I, I forget, it was a female archivist I think that you mentioned, but it was like, come here, it's beautiful, mm -hmm. and she wanted to show you her beautiful pile of yeah. palm leaf manuscripts. And then there were the two men that you encountered in the archive who kind of shrugged when you suggested they might be beautiful and found it really um, the opposite of evocative. And so I'd love to hear you reflect a little bit on what do you do as someone searching for beauty, searching for an aesthetic response to the objects when you come across 
as an ethnographer, and you're like, when you have your ethnographer hat on, what do you do with those differing responses to the manuscript? Well, what do I do with them? Uh, it's much easier to take photographs in the one instance you know, where <laughs> somebody's inviting me to take them yes. <laughs> as opposed to the other one where somebody's actually sort of ushering me through. I think then on reflection, they reveal something very different about the way in which the people are engaging with the material mm -hmm. that they use. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't change my view of those spaces in any way, I don't think. Uh, it certainly opens my eyes to the fact that I'm seeing these things differently than people see them. Right? So the people who never, or didn't seem to bother to look at this archive as something worthy of just looking at and perhaps questioning whether this is a beautiful site or not, whereas I was doing that, right? And I'm on multiple visits there. And uh, I, I find that, even after looking at those images, continues to inspire some sort of feeling in me that I'm looking at something beautiful, objects that were created that uh, stand on their own as works of art. The woman, the woman who said they're beautiful, I don't know that she was thinking of beauty in the same way as I was when I took pictures of them. It very well could have been different. Mm. Uh, but she would open up many of them and show me images, some of the ones that had uh, illustrations, and, and you know, she enjoyed them too. I don't know if it's the same way I enjoyed them. That I don't know that I can, can know. Or just about to the end of our time, so let's continue these conversations uh, over glass of wine at the reception downstairs in the Cayman Gallery as we enjoy Anthony's images. Again, thank you, Anthony, so much for coming and prompting these conversations, and thank you to our panelists. Thank you.